This episode of Within the Wires is brought to you by Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals from blueapron.com slash WTW. Thanks also to Audible for sponsoring Within the Wires. I love Audible. If you're not on Audible, you should get on it. For a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial, go to audible.com slash WTW. That's audible.com slash WTW. And now, an audio guide of El Museo de Arte Contemporaneo, 1974. Welcome to El Museo de Arte Contemporaneo in Lima. My name is Katy Velasquez, and I am the curator of our current exhibition, Cityscapes in Modern Art. We have collected work from a range of artists from all over the world, with help from several of our partner galleries. Included in the collection are three pieces by Claudia Atlleno, including one on loan from the private collection of Atlleno's close personal friend and artistic contemporary, Roy Mata Mangacaia. We are grateful for Remata's contribution to this collection, which she makes in addition to giving us an insight into Agnello's featured works on this audio guide. We are honored to have Manga Caia's insight into the once famous, now mysterious Agnello, who has been missing for over two years. The controversy over her disappearance has generated speculation, ranging from the plausible to the conspiratorial. The opinions expressed in this audio guide are those of the narrator alone. You can find the works discussed here on the east wall of room 2. For tapes discussing the other work included in this exhibition, please see the front desk. It is impossible to discuss Claudia Artiano's cityscapes without discussing her politics. Which is difficult, as she herself never discusses them with anyone. There is little ground for speculation about what her politics are. Or what they were, perhaps. The most we have to go on is her art. And she contradicts herself there frequently. It's possible to argue that her near-constant rudeness to any government officials demonstrates feelings of antagonism or even opposition to the society. But I'm not sure. It is true she was often rude. But this could as much be because of frustrations with bureaucracy as secret thoughts of rebellion. Atieno sketches cities frequently. It's possible that the ideas expressed in these three paintings were often on her mind, but she rarely committed them to canvas. The cities Atieno chose to explore fully always seem to be those in a state of transition. It's possible she's less interested in cities themselves as she is in change, in adaptation and movement, whether for good or ill. Of course, there have been plenty of alterations and transitions during her lifetime, many more than these three included here. She must have had reasons for choosing to depict the three scenes she did. But as she is currently absent from the known world, hopefully not for sinister reasons, although some seem to take a strange delight in spreading rumours, it's up to each of us to try and decipher what her reasons might have been. 1. A palace. Removed. With the removal of nations in 1952 came the removal of the semblance of nations in the years that followed. Flags were destroyed, anthems forgotten, and vast buildings meant as much to give status to governing powers as to serve a practical purpose were demolished. There was preservation, of course, when the buildings in question were seen as having cultural significance outside of their nationalist roles. But often this included the careful moving of the building in question to a more remote area, where its presence would no longer inhibit the development of a more practical, necessary building. Buckingham Palace, by this time more a symbol than a useful building and taking up valuable mid-city space, was carefully taken apart to be reassembled in Somerset as a museum to the history of former England. This process began in 1959 
and took 18 months to complete, and in that time the once grand and revered palace became a shell and was taken away, brick by brick, until it was an empty space. And then a new complex of affordable housing, shops and office spaces was constructed in its place. Artiano's painting depicts the palace almost halfway through being dismantled. It is not particularly true to life. Indeed, it is close to full fantasy. Look at the demolition crew, each carrying with graceful ease upwards of half a dozen blocks on their backs. These stone blocks are almost 50 centimetres wide and nearly as thick. Examine the crew member in the lower left. Their unnaturally wide smile. The sharp angle of their back. How much can you carry on your back? How much do you smile when you do it? In addition, the interior of the palace was stripped at the beginning of the process in order to prevent looting and damage to invaluable artefacts. Artiano, however, recreated the rich decor in the half-undone building. Lush red carpets stretch across the exposed floors and lavishly upholstered furniture stands in its place. There are even ornate vases on rare marble pedestals next to broken walls and wrecking balls. Notice the shadows across each room. They appear at first to be simply cast by the cranes that surround the building or by the clouds that scutter along the sky above. But if you look closely, these shadows appear almost human-like, ghostly figures left behind. Do you see the ballroom on the right side of the painting? Which monarch's shadow do you think is represented here? One of the Henrys? Victoria herself? Or perhaps it is of the, at the time, still living George the Sixth, the last monarch of the Commonwealth. Not a ghost at all, but an incorporeal symbol of a now powerless figure. It's possible to interpret this as Atieno's sympathy for the displaced monarchs, or regret over the loss of national borders and national identity. Many historians mistake Atieno's criticism of the new society for cultural conservatism. Alfra Bond of the Times, called a palace removed facetious slander. Atiero wants to preserve history and culture, but not at the cost of progress and peace, Bond wrote. I have trouble picturing this as being the case. Claudia had little respect for personal ownership of anything, whether a palace or a paintbrush. Indeed, I often found her to have considered my paintbrushes as her own, even when they were propped beside my easel, still wet with paint. She saw no sense in anything, if that thing was not going to be shared. So, regretting the loss of a lavish palace inhabited by one family seems to me unlikely for her. Claudia told me a story of inviting Bond to a gathering at her home in Cornwall. When Bond arrived, the entire party was wearing masks and silently staring at her. She tried to start several conversations, but upon realising the futility of the endeavour, Bond drank a glass of champagne, ate a cucumber sandwich and left calmly. I believe that the shadows in this painting represent the future, not the past at all. They're people who would find use and life and joy in the space left by the building. The ghostly figures belong to the people who right now are living and breathing within the new walls that arose to replace those taken down. Or, of course, it could mean both those things. Or neither. It's possible Claudia simply saw it as an image she liked and adapted it to suit her fancy. Perhaps I shall ask her about it when she resurfaces. Within the Wires is brought to you by Audible. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original shows, news, comedy, and more. Audiobooks are great to listen to when you're, say, going for a run. 
You're just jogging along listening to Patricia Lockwood narrate her funny and moving memoir, Priest Daddy, and you hear her say, I'm not interested in heaven unless my anger gets to go there too. I'm not interested in a happy eternity unless I get to spend an eternity on anger first. Let me speak for the meek and say we don't want the earth if that's where all the bodies are buried. And you coo in literary awe at such words and you accidentally forget to turn left to get back to your house. And hours later you're still jogging and you're on a mountain by now in a completely different nation. And you hear her read the lines, Sometimes I thought I was lonely and it turned out I was in reality wanting a snack. Just like sometimes I have thought I was mad, and it turned out I was actually wearing too many sweaters. And you laugh, and a bobcat starts following you because they can smell humor. You relate to this incredible book so much, and you remember how one time Patricia Lockwood tweeted at the Paris Review, so is Paris any good or what? And the Paris Review replied to Shay, and later they wrote an actual review of Paris. And you tell the bobcat this, and it growls, but it also follows Patricia Lockwood on Twitter. And you take off your headphones and build a fire, and you marry that bobcat and every night before bed, you and Thalia, that's the Bobcat, listen to Patricia Lockwood's Priest Daddy on Audible. Audiobooks are also convenient to listen to when you're doing chores or just sitting at your computer. I cannot recommend Priest Daddy enough. Every chapter is so densely packed with brilliant, pithy, and moving thoughts, and I'm so mad at how I'll never be that good at writing, but it's fine because Patricia Lockwood is. For you, dear Within the Wires listener, get a free audiobook. Why not Priest Daddy? with a 30-day free trial at audible.com slash WTW. If you want a book, I'm pretty dang sure Audible will have it. That's audible.com slash WTW. Within the Wires is also brought to you by Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I have a confession to make. Every week after I make my delicious and affordable meals from Blue Apron, I save the recipes I truly love, which is a lot of them. These recipes are so simple and good and easy to follow, and because Blue Apron has so many different recipes, I'm not sure when I'll ever see these particular ones again. You know, like, maybe some week I've run out of Blue Apron and I want to go to the vault. That's what the folder is labeled, Blue Apron Triple Secret Vault, and make an old recipe. Please don't tell the police that I do this. One of my favorite recipes to remake over and over again is lemongrass burgers with cabbage slaw topped with sriracha mayonnaise and pickled carrots. It's absolutely delicious. When you cook with incredible ingredients, you'll make incredible meals, and hopefully you won't get arrested for it. I'm just really annoyed with myself that I told you all that. Just please don't report me. I have a wife and a cat, and I don't want to... Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm looking at the Blue Apron app and all my old recipes are completely accessible there too. So, um, huh. What do you know? Lots of things, probably. Thanks again to Blue Apron for supporting Within the Wires. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. And now, back to El Museo de Arte Contemporaneo. Two. The parade in Paris. The wistfulness of a palace removed moves to strange melancholy in parade in Paris. Paris did not look much like a city at all after the Great Reckoning, obviously, as so much of it has been destroyed or repurposed for military use. I am not sure whether the scene depicted in this work ever took place. Or if it did, whether Atieno was actually there or simply heard about it later. I don't know how soon after the wars it's meant to be or how far into the implementation of the new society, but oh, perhaps it does not matter. The scene shows a city broken. It is being rebuilt. There are cranes everywhere and even one or two completed new buildings. But there is still, at this stage, more loss than renewal. Paris is in the midst of the impossible task of civic resurrection. And along the streets, we can see a ramshackle, unofficial parade. Notice that the parade does not have floats or balloons or a marching band. It is simply made up of people walking. Ostensibly, this is about citizens who own nothing, celebrating at the end of the reckoning. They cannot afford music, nor decor, but a parade is simply a momentous movement of people through a town. It is easy to look at the gathering and see the optimistic determination of humankind. Look at the faces of those in the parade. Are they optimistic? Are you? But the triumph of humanity is not Atiano's story here. 
look again at the parade. It is made up of people, yes, but more specifically, what kind of people? Do you see each man and each woman? Do you see their uniforms, their vests, their stopping work to march? Perhaps it's a strike. But there's still plenty of other workers doing their jobs. Look closer. Do you see their children? It's a parade of families. There is no reason for them to be there. They're not protesting anything. They're not celebrating anything. Unless they're simply celebrating their own existence. Unless they're simply protesting the hardships contained within it. Artiano released this painting in 1968, but I believe she painted it much earlier. The painting is full of families. And the families are full of joy. And though they don't appear to realise it themselves, they're walking towards a future with no families in them at all. There are a lot of things Claudia could be saying here, of course. She could be deriding the implementation of a society that ignored the concept of a family in favour of universal peace. She could be acknowledging that there is a joy and unity in the midst of destruction. As it happens, I have a fairly strong opinion about this painting, although it's not one that I can support particularly well with evidence. I think the painting is a farewell. Claudia was not made to forget her parents and her siblings, as those of us born a few years later than her were. She had to leave them and relearn what they had taught her. She had to divest herself of her family loyalty and become part of a bigger world. But it turns out loyalty can linger in ways we don't expect. I like this painting. This is a painting I like. Three, the arising. Both the London cityscape and the Paris one deal in destruction. Although the view of Paris includes aspects of rebuilding and therefore renewal, they serve more to highlight the remaining destruction and loss that surrounds them. The arising looks at what was newly created in the changing landscape of society. It shows a street in Cotatour, Jakarta probably in the early 1960s. Atiano visited the former Dutch East Indies with a mutual friend of ours, the artist Cassandra Reza. They travelled extensively together for a time. The painting is simple at first glance. See how the street, while mostly empty, has been rebuilt from scratch with a specific purpose in mind. Low buildings line the street with an open, grassy square about a third of the way down. The buildings are new. The square is carefully planned and cultivated. Look at the children in it, playing together with hoops and balls. Some of them are reading. Some are sitting on the ground, talking. What books are they reading? What are the children talking about? You know, but you have been made to forget. The complex depicted in Atiano's painting, set up on the abandoned street in Cotatua, was one of the first collective homes set up. You can see the caretakers dotted around. The children, of course, are all under ten. Once they're ten, they'll be set on the path towards adulthood, leaving behind every memory they made in this place. It is a picture of innocence, but there is a darkness to it. Look at the adults around the edge of the park, their backs stiff, arms straight, faces almost without features. Do you feel a sense of tightly wound control? I only met Cassandra Razor once or twice when Claudia was there. I don't know if Claudia knew that I had kept in touch with Cassandra, that I had even stayed with her once at her home in Nicosia. Cassandra has a large studio full of work that the public has never seen. Some of it was unfinished. Some of it was barely started. I looked through it once. I don't know if Cassandra knew that I saw that painting, the one of the street in Cotatua, Jakarta, with the new buildings, with the square, 
with the children and caretakers and innocence stained by control. It was her painting. It was different than the one you're looking at now. Notice the children in the public park and the adults standing like prison bars around its perimeter. Cassandra's painting had none of this ominous political subtext. It was a celebration of rebirth, of a new world. It was beautiful and inspiring, and I hope the world will see it someday. But I doubt Cassandra could prove at this point that she painted hers first. I can't prove that either, but I know. All of us in Claudia's life knew. In retrospect, I wasn't surprised to find that painting. I honestly would have been more surprised not to. I didn't tell Claudia. I never told Claudia. I didn't tell Cassandra either. I don't know what I thought Claudia would do if I told her what I had seen. Maybe she would have demanded that I acknowledge her painting to be the better of the two, anyway. Maybe she would have pretended not to understand. Maybe she would have thrown something. Maybe she'll object to this if I ever see her again. I suppose I should say when I see her again. I'm sure we will have words if I do see her again, but Claudia didn't hold grudges. Doesn't hold grudges. I'm trying to remember to use present tense. Didn't hold grudges, doesn't hold grudges. Uh, Claudia is, not was. Claudia doesn't hold grudges, but others do. Present tense. Present tense. Okay, yeah, we're done. Within the Wires is written by Jeffrey Creener and Janina Mathewson and performed by Rima Tewiata with original music by Mary Epworth. Find more of Mary's music at maryepworth.com. The voice of Katie Velasquez was Anaris Canonis. Thanks again to Audible for supporting Within the Wires. Get your free audiobook with a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash WTW. Thanks also to Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash WTW. And if you haven't already, go to WithinTheWires.com and fill out our audience survey. It's a brief thing and it only helps us with advertisers. It's a great way for free to support our show. Within the Wires is a production of Night Vale Presents. Check out our other podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale and Conversations with People Who Hate Me. And our two newest podcasts starting this month, It Makes a Sound and I Only Listen to the Mountain Goats. Okay, our time is done. It's you time now. Time to stop by the museum gift shop. Grab yourself a souvenir book of paintings about paintings about paintings. Pick up a poster featuring your mom and buy a commemorative vase made out of weird Twitter jokes. This has been a production of Night Vale Presents. Find out more about us and our shows at nightvalepresents.com. Hey, thanks for listening to episode three of Within the Wires. Stay tuned right now for the pilot episode of Night Vale Presents newest fiction podcast, It Makes a Sound by Jacqueline Langraff. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever it is you get your podcasts. When a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it, it makes a sound. Ladies and gentlemen, we have found the music. It had been lost, as so many things are lost. Missing, disappeared, misplaced, vanished. Every day, what falls into obscurity without anybody noticing? Without anybody paying attention? What is locked in the attic? Uh, I mean, let's talk about some things that have been found in an attic or spaces like attics. 
Did you know that Van Gogh's Sunset at Montmajour, that beautiful painting, was found in an attic? Or that the original handwritten manuscript of Huckleberry Finn was found in an attic? The Venus de Milo was, well, no, it was not, not an attic, but buried in a farmer's field, unearthed by a peasant who came across some stubborn soil. Did you know that the only copy of the pilot of I Love Lucy lay under the bed of Peppino the Clown for 30 years until it was swept out by his widow when she finally cleaned up around the place and thought to herself, this is pretty funny. All these masterpieces just a broom sweep away from history's dustbins. And today, today, recovered from a neglected attic of a suburban townhouse, one cassette tape destined to be sold in a garage sale, containing what is likely to be the first recorded concert of Wim Ferros. So, who is listening? Hello, I'm Deirdre Gardner, and I welcome you to my new show. It makes a sound. It's the first and only show in the nation dedicated to Wim Farrow's native son of our Rosemary Hills, where together we'll be part of a musical legacy. We will prepare to receive the genius that is Wim Farrow's and to return him like a prodigal son to this deprived land. I will be the one to provide you up-to-the-minute news and information about the artist as I discover it. The name, Wim Farrows. The subject, genius. And its location. Where is extraordinariness? I ask myself, don't you? Don't you ask yourself that? Extraordinariness. Where is it today? Where are the truly exceptional ones who, out of our sheer proximity to them, allow us to glimpse the intersection of our little lives with the profound? Who walks among us? Is there anyone? Who walks among us? All the little uses. Us is rolling lint off our pants. Us is squeezing avocados at the grocery store and never picking the ripe one. Us is um, driving up and down the side streets to work because the highway frightens us. Us is um, drinking chamomile, attempting inverted yoga poses, popping melatonin, and crossing our fingers as we slink into bed for the night. Where can we look here? In this vast we read landscape of Rosemary Hills, where our weathered old water tower reminds us in fading letters of past town mottos, such as golf capital, or Rosemary Hills is alive with the whir of commerce, or let's tea in the hills. But where now the best boast we can muster is easy access to the highway. Well, here, amidst the now abandoned golf course and its neglected grass, amidst the shuttered strip malls and these potholed streets, the extraordinary has tread. And the footprints, they linger. If you know how to look for them, and I think I do. My fellow people of Rosemary Hills, citizens of the world, what have you forgotten? 
What treasures have we hidden under cobwebs and dust? What beauty awaits us on the other side of that drywall as we wrestle fitfully in our sleep? What life lingers on these old fairways? What wonders just passed us by as we bowed our head towards a, a bright and three-inch screen? Our necks hurt. Our brains are zapped from too much screen time. Our souls ache. And suddenly decades have passed us by. Like poof. What are we missing? Do we remember what used to be held in delicate folds of our heart? Don't we remember how things used to sound, smell, feel, taste? I want to. It's time to unpack the attic. Today, we have a mind-boggling discovery, a confirmed to be authentic tape containing what is known to be Wim Ferros's debut public musical appearance here in Rosemary Hills in the year 1992. And so we're not going to rush this moment like we rush everything. We're going to slow down. We're going to savor we are going to consider the tremendous significance of this relic in order to fully appreciate it. And thus, it is my privilege on this day of days to hold in my hands this freshly discovered tape. It's an ordinary looking cassette tape, but it's possible some of you have never held a cassette tape. I will explain. Because though it contains the stuff of wonder, to the human eye, it is just a three and a half by two inch clear plastic rectangle with two holes in the middle. And these holes, they have six little black teeth non-threatening teeth, so that you could feasibly uh, insert a pencil or a pinky finger should something go awry, like if the delicate tape needs your manual assistance. Now that tape is a very thin, translucent gray strip, of course, containing some magnet, um, magnetic properties. So, and it's spooled around the left hole. And as the tape plays in the cassette tape player, the tape will run along the bottom edge of the rectangle across a tiny magnetic strip. And the magnets pull the music out with magnetic force until it is fully spooled around the right hole, which means the tape is finished and you have heard the music. And that's how a cassette tape works. I'm Deirdre Gardner. This is It Makes a Sound. I am describing a cassette tape, perhaps the most important cassette tape that ever was. Now on this particular model, we have a yellow sticker that covers the smooth section of the cassette. And written on that cover in purple felt tip pen in bubble letters is Wim Fa. But a water spot has obscured the rose, leaving a purpley pink splotch. It's very pretty, like a watercolor. And underneath, with that same pen and font, 1992. Crudely drawn stars in um, multiple colors of pen speckle the entire sticker. I mean... It's great. It's really incredible that one small object can capture so much about an entire era, even just aesthetically. 
We all seek the soundtrack of our lives, don't we? And we wish to be privy to the voices of our generation. Yet it is a profound rarity that an artist like Wim Ferros crosses into your limited sphere of existence. It's like an alien prophet touching down on an ordinary Tuesday afternoon in a chain store called The Last Tupper, suddenly making the universe crack open to reveal infinite shards of meaning barely comprehensible to you, standing there in cargo shorts holding a casserole dish. Yes, yes. It's hard to determine the full effect of Wim Ferros's music on the simple town of Rosemary Hills in the early to mid-90s. It's difficult to quantify the extent of sacred devotion he inspired in his earliest fan base. How do you hold a moonbeam in your hand? That was a time without social media and its um, incessant public proclamations to hashtag trending desires of the moment. Yesterday's youth had to be more intuitively united in our common affections. Had to keep the faith that even in a friendless existence, for instance, as an example, living in an inherited furnished townhouse on the edge of Rosemary Hill's gated golf course community, there were kindred souls somewhere underneath that same blue sky, wishing and waiting for a connection just like you. Though perhaps at times to love in solitude, from afar, in the most generic of settings, was lonely and painful. That melancholy was trumped by a feeling of purpose. The purpose that comes from knowing that if someone out there could so perfectly capture the nuanced secrets of your soul, there must be greatness and solace in this universe indeed. Isn't that why we listen to the music? Isn't that why we listen to the music? We must ready ourselves to listen to the music. But I will say, even without the ease and the benefit of cached fan pages, or blogs serving as testimony to the early Wim Ferro's effect, the artist did manage to be a catalyst of cultural awakening in the town zeitgeist. If a town can have a zeitgeist, can it? Sure. And there is archival evidence of the first reactions to Ferro's artistry. In fact... I happen to be in possession of documents from a Rosemary Hills resident who encountered Wim Ferros in his earliest musical phase. Now, some of these pages are enclosed within a, a purple velveteen diary that I now have in front of me. The writing appears to be by the hand of a 12-year-old. I would estimate, and the paper is wide ruled. And I seem to have come across a lengthy series of haiku. Now, perhaps I should share just a few of these with you for the sake of research. It's a segment. We'll call it the poetry of a little us. 
You have changed my life by allowing me to see even though you don't see me. I am hard to see in a golf community with many sand traps. You have a blind spot for almost nothing but one in the size of me. I am the catcher. You are a rare butterfly that I cannot grasp. Butterflies up close freak me out, but you fly free, beautiful and free. I catch butterflies, yes, but I am afraid too, a contradiction. Faithfully you come to the window of my dreams singing la la la. What is this music? Like, I never heard music before you played it. <sighs> now, those are just a few haikus and there are lots more <laughs> written here in Rosemary Hills circa 1991-1992 likely dedicated to one Wim Ferros. If you're just tuning in, hello, welcome. I'm Deirdre Gardner, and this is the first episode of my show. It makes a sound. A discovery has been made in the attic. It's Wim Ferros's first live album. It's the real deal. It's not a hoax. And it's so rare that the only known copy exists recorded from some distance on a cassette tape. There is nowhere else in the entire universe where you will be able to hear a 16-year-old Wim Ferros shaping what comes to be known as the sound of an epic. E-P-O-C-H. Stay with me and you will hear it here first, folks, because I have the tape and you're going to get exclusive access. So, we're discussing Wim Ferros's formative teenage years as a musician right here in Rosemary Hills. We've just begun working towards a fuller understanding of the human behind Who's the... Who's there? Mu- huh? Oh, jeez. I know. I know. Are you okay? I know you. I knew. Are you asleep? Are you? Who's that? Okay. 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 Everything is good. I'm back. And I'm excited to introduce a new oral history segment of the show based on town legend and lore around Wim Ferros. It's called A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. A light in the window of the second floor, the only window on the second floor, means Wim Ferros is in his bedroom. And almost always, when he is in his bedroom, he is drawing on the wall. What was on that wall? Everything was on that wall. The winds of change blew on that wall. The unfettered scrawl of technicolor wonders. The rainbow, a 
paltry container for the variety of colors applied to that wall. New color names would have to be invented. The ongoing, overlapping, shifting images and symbols, mural, frescoed, appliqued on that wall. All of these ideas spewing forth from the eclectic multitudes of a single creative mind in a blue and tan flannel shirt, his right arm braced against the drywall in an L shape above his head. The bottom of his sleeve ripped and hanging down, he looks like he's whispering secrets in a confessional, but he is drawing. There's a, a lava lamp somewhere out of view of the window, and it casts blobby spots that climb up and down the room, catching Wim's distorted shadow when he's out of view of the window frame. His left hand moves delicately, or scribbles furiously. He is left-handed, as statistics prove that most geniuses are. And if you'd been watching over the course of several months, you would have seen his fantastic mural take shape. In the center, a five-foot-tall octopus with the uncannily rendered face of Diane Sawyer. Her arms spread open, Christ-like, with magnolia blossoms and spiders dripping from her fingers. A flock of owls flying over a forest of pine trees. Each phase of the moon paired with a pizza pie of differing toppings. Eight personalized pan pizzas for eight different moons. A ninja army battling a family of squirrels throwing sharp acorns. Pages falling from a Gutenberg Bible into the gaping mouth of a Native American chief. Snoop Dogg. Scully riding a Mulder centaur as Ross Perot hoverboards over their heads. He was getting political. As the seasons pass, the wall incrementally becomes an intricate map of his fertile fertile inner life. Repetitions of hummingbirds, and starfish, cans of beans, nunchucks, later peacocks, a dragon breathing fire, melting the iceberg just before it sinks the Titanic, which passes into clear skies. Dracula playing video games in front of a television set, flickering with an image of outrage from the Rodney King riots. And toaster strudels flying out of toasters into the rings of Saturn. Kurt Cobain offering an origami swan to a sobbing river phoenix. and hundreds of other elegantly drawn details too small to make out from a distance that create a constellation of enlightened connectivity across the peeling beige wall. And almost every night, after all the lights in the windows of the bungalow go dark, if you cared enough to pay attention, you would see the single beam of a flashlight splice a path behind the house, pointed towards a lopsided shed some 40 yards away. And if you were standing right up against the fence that separates Rosemary Hill's gated golf course community from the unincorporated land that stretched out behind the scattered houses on Camellia Road, you would hear a soulful strum of guitar and a crescendo of drums 
Because in that decaying shed, surrounded by the loneliest darkness that is suburban darkness, is where young whim pharaohs made the music. It was that music that pulsed through this town, permeated the air, pumped through the water. Did everyone hearken to the call? No. If a tree falls in a forest and no one's around to hear it fall, does it make a sound? Well, I'm here to tell you, trees have fallen. Trees are falling. And you may listen, but do you hear? People of Rosemary Hills, it is time to hear. It is time to hearken. Hearken. I believe in your ears. Wim Pharaoh sang for you. You didn't know, but he will sing for you again. He has been lost in the attic, but now he is found. And maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe you've been lost in the attic too. There was greatness in our midst, transcendence eccentricity, nuance. I'm Deirdre Gardner, and I believe that when a tree falls in a forest, it makes a sound. And I'm inviting you to try to truly hear and to remember. So stay tuned for my next episode when that music, lost but now found, will be born again straight into your ears. When you hear the first track from Wim Ferros's debut concert. The first track, perhaps, of the rest of your life. This has been the inaugural episode of the first and only show in the nation dedicated to the music and legacy of Wim Ferros. Thank you for listening. If you have any information about Wim Ferros that you think should be shared with our listeners, or if you own a working cassette tape player, do not hesitate to contact me. Um, I... I guess for now you should just um, email me at ddg at no let's not do that um I'll create a I'll create a new yes you can contact me at wimferos at aol actually no please contact it makes a sound at aol dot com thank you. I'm Deirdre Gardner. Till next time. It Makes a Sound is created and written by Jacqueline Landgraf. Co-directed by Jacqueline Landgraf and Anya Saffer. Sound designed and engineered by me, Vincent Cachione. Original music by Nate Wida with Jacqueline Landgraf as Deirdre Gardner and featuring Annie Golden as the voice from downstairs. It Makes a Sound as a Night Vale Presents production. For more information on this show and other Night Vale podcasts, go to nightvalepresents.com. We hope you'll rate and review It Makes a Sound on Apple Podcasts and that you'll tell your friends and all sorts of other humans to listen to the show, to hearken to the trees and remember Wim Pharaohs. <laughs>